Welcome to podcast four for Shakespeare. This podcast will cover two different handouts, one called Commonly Used Literary Terms, which has probably scared you to death and I want to reassure you, and the other which is called Theater Terminology. So first, let's begin with the commonly used terms. I have coordinated for you as many terms as I could think of that could be useful to you, um, whether it's for Shakespeare or for um, studies in fiction, um, so that you have them all in one place. And I'm hoping that this will be a useful tool for you. Let's pull out some of the ones that are perhaps more useful for theater. For example, um, when you have an exposition scene, an exposition scene, whether it's in a short story, a novel, or a play, that's where the reader or the spectator learns everything that person needs to know in order to understand what follows in the work of art. All right? Sometimes these are entire, and sometimes they're what we call discontinuous. They can be broken up into pieces so that you get that information slowly. And what's going to come after that is, of course, the first complication. All right, and you have complication over here. These are common words that you already probably know. Let's just fill in these more specific definitions. Um, you also have, for example, the tragic hero who has most likely a tragic flaw, if it's a really tragic play. Um, and also there's that moment of recognition um, where the irony of what the person has done becomes clear to that person when Brutus, in fact, creates the fall of Republican Rome, which he was trying to save. He is the one who effects the fall, and he has recognition of that moment. Peripodes, that may be a new word for you, or peripateia. Peripateia is the plural, and these are moments of complications where excitement jumps a notch. So if you are making a graph of the dramatic tension, these are moments when up, you have a, a slight increase in that dramatic tension and then it will level off again and you'll have another jump. So perhaps a new word for you. Let's look now at the terminology specific to the theater. Um, you have, for example, these Greek terms and not so much that Shakespeare would have used these terms, but he would have understood Greek and Roman plays where these four terms labeled the different movements of the action, protasis, epitasis, catastasis, and catastrophe, which is a good friend for you. Pro, you can think of, for example, exposition, complication, moment of crisis, and the catastrophe. English terms, induction. In The Taming of the Shrew, you're going to see an induction scene. This is a scene that is removed from the rest of the play, and which leads a lot of scholars to call the play a play within a play. There is no conclusion to the induction in The Taming of the Shrew, which has also led scholars to imagine that maybe it was added on or maybe a conclusion was lost. So the induction is a fun part. I've put it in parentheses so that you understand it is separate from the main action. Exposition, now you know, complication, rising action, crisis, climax, recognition, resolution. There are also some different words that you'll need to be familiar with in order to talk um, knowledgeably about what's going on within the play. And some of these fall under the title of internal structure. These are the elements that are there that are shaped to make the play work. These are two that are familiar, obviously. Protagonist and antagonist. A stock character is one that, um, for example, the fool, um, is one that you'll find easily. We have those today, and I won't mention them because you'll tell me I'm, I'm uh, carrying around stereotypes. Uh, sometimes you also have a reliable character. This is a character in highly ambiguous plays who is invested with the role of telling you what is right and what is wrong, reminding you of the morality or immorality of a situation. Um, there's a very good reliable character called Kent in King Lear, for example. Onomastic imagery, I'm going to jump down. Onomastic imagery is a big word to say someone whose proper name, or the proper noun, their name, actually gives meaning to the play. 
um, and you'll see some of these in, in for example, characters named Doll, Doll Tearsheet. Um, we can imagine that the young lady is in fact a prostitute. Other words that you need to be familiar with, plot and subplot. You have a main plot and quite often you have a subplot that supports it. You will have the main plot mirrored, sometimes in a grotesque way, as in the case of The Tempest, in the subplot. All right, it's a lesser action of less import, shall we say, but by mirroring and throwing back the image of the plot, you see the plot in a new way. Some plays have a double plot, and we also can talk about a line of intrigue for plot. Catharsis, we know this, and if you don't, you need to look up Aristotle. Catharsis is when I go to a play, and as I watch certain things happening, I myself am purged of the desire to do evil. Um, open or close denouement. So sometimes the closing of a play, or the denouement, um, remains open. Uh, for example, um, num part two of Henry VI ends quite simply with the characters running off the stage to try to find the king. Of course, he's planned to show part three probably the next day or the next week, so they run back on stage. But an open denouement is, is in fact one that does not answer the final questions and leaves you thinking about what the play has in fact uh, accomplished. In Medias Res is of course the way the Iliad begins. The action is already in movement. The train has already left the station. The three unities, you'll need to know these, time, place, and action. Time and place are given by Aristotle, and action is what is assumed by these two. Um, sometimes you'll have ele elements of foreshadowing, and here's your peripety or peripeteia. Some of the other things I want you to look at, because we'll be talking about the parts of plays. For example, uh, you may have tragedy within a play, but a comic subplot. Or maybe the play is largely comic and some tragedy within that subplot. Um, tragic comedy is the blending of the two. It begins as a tragedy, and fortuitously the word does too, <laughs> but it ends happily. Think of Romeo and Juliet, it begins happily and in sadly. Melodrama, satire, burlesque, mask, dumb show. These are all words, I would cut off here because these describe modern theater, but these are all words that can be used when talking about Shakespearean theater. I'm going to look at some of the external structures and some of the, the ways that Shakespeare um, shapes his plays. For example, monologue and soliloquy. These are often sparingly used, and when attention is given to a character through these, we can talk about a fracturing of focus. For example, if Iago and Othello are given equal numbers of soliloquies, of lines of soliloquies, why is that? Why is Shakespeare presenting that pure evil in parallel with the pure good? Also, asides, these are moments when the wall is broken down and a character is speaking directly to the audience, but of course, these are the character's true feelings. If a character is untrue in these, the play cannot be understood. We have to assume that they are telling us the truth in each of these. Of course, outside of these two major forms of speeches, you have dialogue, which is the most common. And dialogue can become more tense, and that form, that heightened version, is called stichomythia. Now this is when you have short narrations, line narrations, where back and forth uh, characters are throwing insults at one another, or the tension is increasing because of what is being discussed. But it's short lines, either half lines or full, but short lines back and forth between two, at the most, three characters. Very common in Shakespeare, and I want you to look at it, look for it, so that you can recognize when he wants you to be on the edge of your chair. Deus Ex Machina is when the gods come down from the machine, a Greek term for what really happened at the end of Greek plays, when uh, they couldn't resolve the problem and the gods had to come down and figure it out for man. Um, sometimes you'll sense that this is what's happening in comic plays, for example, 
rare in tragedy. Dramatic irony, this is of course just one form of irony, but you need to be aware of it. Um, the dramatic situation is simply describing the context and verse and prose. Um, please don't leave my class without knowing the difference between verse and prose. And finally, we have some stage considerations. First of all, you have scenic space and dramatic space. The scenic space is the stage itself and whatever populates it. The dramatic space, which is far more important in Elizabethan and Jacobian studies, is that space that's populated by the spectator's mind. This is what is, this is your creative energies going in to dress up this space and make those boys who are playing girls into women, for example. You fill in the gaps. If we're supposed to be in Verona, you see something that is Italian-like. This is what we see and this is what we imagine. Proscenium Arch is in fact what distinguishes the stage that followed Shakespeare from his own. This is the frame that is around a stage that you see today fairly frequently, I would say more often than not, if you go to the theater. Um, it's the stage that sets the, what's going on, the action on the stage, apart from the audience. Shakespeare's um, stage had a roof, of course, to protect the uh, actors from the rain, but he did not have an arch going over it to separate that action. His action was viewed from all sides. So proscenium arch is what we have today, but what Shakespeare did not have, even when he moved to the indoor venue of the Blackfriars Theater, they did not have that. They did have perspective decor, especially in the indoor theater. Um, there was a very famous Italian architect who had begun making scenic uh, arrangements or decors on the stages that showed in perspective a street or something like that, um, or a room, even a large room in a noble's home. So you might think that he didn't have any stage decor, but they did, especially in that indoor theater. Here's a word I want you to remember as well, and that's verisimilitude, and that is the believability. So typically we talk about suspending disbelief when we, when we move to the dramatic space because we're talking about um, boys playing girls, a dirty stage, peanut crunchers all around. That person has to fill in, as I said, and suspend disbelief in order to follow the play and fill it in. Sometimes that, that verisimilitude or realism is um, compromised, and we'll talk more about that. But verisimilitude is a form of realism, and it involves the degree to which you have to work to create that dramatic space. And I'll leave these to you for your future studies in theater. Thank you very much, and have a nice evening.